Welcome to God Killer Last Hope. My name is Zoe Williams, and as the dramaturg for this production, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the viciously divine world of The Cradle. Last Hope is a dark fantasy series that deals with heavy topics, and content warnings will be shared before the show begins. Last Hope is performed live and in studio by Connie Chong and C. Thomas. Previously on God Killer Last Hope, Whitney and Tian Sheng arrive in the mortal realm of Yao Lan. They land in Chuin, one of the five great earthly kingdoms currently suffering at the hands of their traditionalist ruler, King Wu. For the first time in their life, Litany travels under the sun, the moon, the stars, and they learn about Yao Lan from Tian Sheng, and they form their very first mortal bond. A full recap of this and previous episodes can be found at transplanerrpg.com. And now, the game begins. God Killer Last Hope is a dark fantasy actual play series that deals with serious and potentially triggering topics. Viewer discretion is advised. Content warnings for this episode include fantasy violence, blood, trauma, grief, interpersonal conflict, war, fire, displacement, references to Igor and decapitation, and mentions of death, killing, falling, poverty, malnutrition, explosions, landslides, tapophobia, emotional negligence by a parent, and brief sounds of spitting. Litany. New Mudan village opens up in front of you as you and Tian Sheng crest a hill. And the trees part and fade to give way to a bustling mountain stronghold built on stilts. You see humble little homes perched on the edges of this cliff face, carved into harmony with the nature around it. You hear birdsong and you see the swooping wings of pigeons and doves and other kinds of birds whose names you haven't learned yet. Names Tian Sheng hasn't had the opportunity to teach you at this juncture. You see a large, old, worn wooden gate planted into the soil, almost like the trunks of a hardy tree, uh, with an archway over the top with wooden slats and calligraphy reading New Mudan Village. And you also see the people, the people climbing down ladders, the people uh, practicing sword forms in dusty training arenas just beyond the fence post. And you also see people loading munitions and supplies onto the backs of small wagons and trying to shrug on backpacks, almost as though they're preparing for some sort of voyage or travel. And there's a sense of excitement in New Mudan Village, a sense of determination and eagerness, like everyone's getting ready for something that's about to happen, something that's about to come. And there's a moment where Tian Sheng pauses on the road right before you crest the gate and takes in her home, these people that have welcomed her into their fold. Ah, <sighs> New Mudan Village, home. Instead of looking at the village, as they are coming up, I think Whitney is looking at Tian Sheng, mm. watching her face as she sees home for the first time, taking mm. in every expression, every moment, every little emotion that flits across her face. Mm. They're catching all of it. They're watching all of it. They're looking at her. They see the pigeons. They see the sword forms. They see the horses. They see the munitions. They see the war that has touched even this place, strangely enough, all the way up nestled in these mountains. And they see the solidness on her face coming to this place, the determination, the purpose, like recognizing like. Hmm. And what emotion is ringing through you as you see an expression of joy, happiness, a kind of ardent passion and love? <laughs> Breaking open on Tian Sheng's face as she regards her home in the heartbeats before she crests through the threshold. Envy. There's a small beat of it, uh, an emotion that I don't think Litany can actually recognize. 
but when it flares inside of them, it rings solid and true. Envy. They want their face to make that expression. They want to look at the underworld gate. When they go home after they've killed Long Dew, they want to look like that going home. They don't want to fall through the world and down, 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 all the way back into the underworld, into the river of blood. They want to walk with their head held high, as she does, back into the place they belong. Right? Right. Maybe. Maybe not. Tian Sheng crosses the threshold and enters New Mudan village. And that staff is on her back, her arms are waving, she's gesticulating and saying hello, greeting these villagers, most of whom are so busy, they don't notice her at first. They're so busy packing up backpacks, preparing for a voyage, as far as you can tell, for travel. And then she starts to get swarmed by a bunch of people and you hear her, uh, not the exact words, but the overall um, intonation of her voice as she's asking what's going on, what's happening, hey, how are you doing? What's what's all this? You get the sense that Tian Sheng's not really sure what the villagers of this place are up to. So you take a beat right outside the gate and tell me how you start to crest the threshold. Like walking into dawn for the first time with that same hesitation of the violence of the sun as it rises on the horizon, but an inevitability of it. They have to go. They have to follow her. Okay. And so they step through the threshold. Yeah, this is just part of your fate, part of your destiny, part of the path that has been thrusted upon you and that you have chosen to take. And for no reason whatsoever, Litany, do you have any ill intentions toward the people of New Mudan Village? That is such an interesting question to ask, Connie. Can I... Um, no, uh, you cannot ask for context or clarity. Just uh, simply yes or no, simply yes or no answer. Let's roll for it. What? What do you mean roll for it? What does a six mean? We have to establish parameters before we roll dice. Litany wishes no ill will upon anyone here. These are mortals. Uh huh. They kill gods. That's true. That is that is very true to your character. I'm now really curious what would happen if you had rolled a one. <laughs> then, then the ill will would have bled from them. <laughs> then we roll initiative. Uh, there's no initiative in this game. Uh, so okay. As you cross the threshold, you feel something waver, not against your skin, not against your blood, your nervous system, your bones, but against your very soul itself. A kind of magic, a protection spell. And there's no other way to describe the tenor of this magic aside from the fact that it is orange. That's all it is, orange and you flash to the temple, that old wooden shrine, the sound of rain pattering warmly against wooden slats steepled above your head like hands clasped in prayer, drinking rain, the flash of orange from the eyes of that carved wooden god. Orange, you're back in your body. Can I pray for guidance? <gasps> Yes, uh, this is the first time we're using this move, so I'm so excited. This is a mortal move, a brand new one. Um, when you pray for guidance, name the aid you seek and answer one. I will describe the aid that actually comes as I answer the other. So these two questions are, what kind of god answers your prayers? And what unclear omens or visions besiege me? <laughs> I would actually like to answer what unclear omens and visions besiege me because okay. as Litany takes the step into this protected hamlet, that prayer from Tian Shen comes back to the front of their mind. Protection for their home, for this place, for that fire, for everything that has happened in the past. And I think as that is coming back into their mind, that memory, they see this mortal place, the rhythm of it, the tenor of it, the beating heart of it that they don't understand. Even when their hand was inside Long Du's chest, they didn't understand what it meant to be mortal. And here it is again, all of these mortals, what are they doing? How are they? They see the love and the empathy and everything, everything here. And I think that 
hits against the inside of their chest, the inside of their soul, even if they don't wish ill will, there is a tearing, a dissonance, a, a low humming ring tearing them open and it's Swayzian's face again, again, and they check their knuckle, but there's no more blood. It's been days now. The rain washed it off. Hmm. There's no blood on your knuckles anymore, but why can you still feel the weight of it against your skin? The curse, it must be the curse. That's it, it must be the curse. Those last words falling from your mentor's lips. And tell me, Litany, what aid do you seek in this moment? I must have guidance to the Ascension Gate. I don't belong here. Right? I guess we'll find out. I will answer what kind of god answers your prayers. Hmm. Given the nature of the shattering in this world and how gods are, are difficult to reach, I think what occurs is as you focus on your goal, the Ascension Gate, you feel that swell of orange inside you again. You smell a burst of it too, actual oranges, clementines? And you think of the clementines on the shrine of that god. And then I think you follow your nose, your soul, and you swivel your head in the direction of not the largest house here. No, the largest house on Stiltir is a community center of sorts, but definitely a house that overlooks everything else, a house of leadership, the highest point on the hill of Mudan village. It's leading you there. That's where you'll find answers about the Ascension Gate because the gate you walked through, that was not an ascension gate and you don't see any pillars of blood or steepled tiles of uh, silver plated bone here whatsoever. And as you center yourself again, that's when you hear footsteps along this village path and Tiancheng approaches you once more. There's a look of urgency and a little bit of confusion on her face as she comes. Hey, sorry about that. I just had to, you know, catch up with some folks. They're going on a trip somewhere. They said I should just check in with Rui. So we should just go check in with Rui. Who's Rui? Oh my gods, you're absolutely right. I haven't even told you anything about Rui. She's uh, she's the leader of New Mudan Village. We grew up together, kind of. She grew up and then I was there. Yeah, I'm like 300 something years old, so you understand. She's only like 23. Where's the 24? No, her birthday is in three months, so 23. I'm, that's completely irrelevant. Follow me. And Tiansheng sets off toward that house on that hill. Tiansheng has been Tiansheng has been Litany's mortal guide mm -hmm. through Yaolan for five days now. Yes. And there are these momentary hiccups between mm -hmm. them, these gulfs that seem to grow and then expand and contract like wind, like breeze, like weather, <laughs> like whether they've never experienced the weather of her. Mm. I would like to use my Vagabond move, Connie, because I have killed more than one god in this yes. campaign. Yes! Okay, that's a renowned move, which is basically your reputation as a god killer, special things you can access because of that. Okay. Litany is staring into the back of Tian Sheng's head. As they're okay. walking up this hill, I imagine that she's hurrying along faster she's than like we hurry. a little. Yeah, no, she was kind of like taken, in comparison, taking her sweet time to get here. Not like because she is urgent to return, but kind of letting you smell the flowers and whatnot. Yeah, and as that begins to shift and change, I would like to know what aren't they telling me? Oh, you're just going to straight up ask me that? I'm going to straight up ask you that. <gasps> okay. And Litany is casting their gaze around to the rest of this village, this place. There is this an... They don't know much about the mortal realm, but this is an odd place for an ascension gate. Yeah. This is an odd place for all of these mortals to be gathering with yeah. weapons and horses and training. And there's no army here. No one's dressed in army fatigues. What the hell is going on? Okay. Con. Okay. Yeah. All I'd right. I'd like to know. So yeah. Okay. Give me the lore. What are they telling you? A lot. It'd be hilarious if I just stop there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's definitely something going on with the ascension gate that tian is not being completely forthright about but based on your prayer earlier you get the sense that you will find the clarity you seek in that house maybe from this rui person even because tian Sheng is so reticent maybe rui will tell you something uh in terms of what's going on here yeah you see people training 
You see that part of the equipment and munitions that they're packing onto wagons are weapons, are armor. There's not a militancy here. This isn't a military camp, right? You don't see people in full armor walking around doing drills, but there is a sense of almost rebellion among the people here. A sense of like, we're fighting together for a cause, hmm. right? One moment. Okay, yeah, I love that you're taking a note about this. Uh, Lovely. So you follow Tian Sheng up this winding path, this series of switchbacks, uh, eking their way up this rather steep terraced mountain hill. And as you do, you pass little gardens on these terraces, rice paddies, tea bushes, uh, courtyards. This place feels very much like a home, though it doesn't feel like an ancient village. The gate, the wood of the gate looks old, but then you remember, you think of when you cross the threshold, the dirt around it didn't look new, but it didn't look like it's been buried there forever. And you notice that a lot of the wood here, there's still like fresh shavings on the edges of some of them, right? And you see the people here, a lot of the plants that they're tending to look like they've only maybe gone through a couple of, what's the word, seasons? Seasons, seasons. And then you surface the final switchback and you find yourself at the entrance to this small, humble little courtyard that's not more grand or lavish than any other courtyard here. And you step into the abode of this presumably Rui person following Tian Shang. She slides the door open and there you see her, Rui. Rui is a young mortal woman, 23 years of age, at most. She is draped in these white robes with green embroidery, and you see a set of fans tucked into the sash that cinches uh, the bottom part of her robes, the skirt. She has dark skin, very dark, and black thick locks in a low ponytail. And these intense dark brown eyes as she's currently pouring over, as far as you can tell, a map of the kingdom that you're in a map of Twin. In fact, you see an illustrated depiction of the amethyst chain along the southwestern band of this map. And Rui is not alone. There is a man, a young man, maybe only a few years older than her, 24, 25 at most, uh, standing across the table from her. And he does not look like any other person in this village. You can tell immediately because he's dressed in full military scale armor. He's got this like red and gold plate scale tile on with this black trim, a big, uh, beautifully decorated gold belt buckle. And you see that he's armed, though not currently holding the weapons. You see a pair of dao blades strapped to his waist and a crossbow strapped to his back. And you notice that he doesn't have a helm on, so he has short black hair and these intense black eyes, but his helm is on the table with a little, um, little red poof coming out from the top of it, uh, like a military commander might have, because some of the demon commanders of your queen's army wear similar armor, a reminder of the time when they were still mortals, when they were still alive. Mm. Uh, and you also notice, because you've seen armies marching in the distance up until this point. It's the same armor. Exact same armor. Mm. As soon as Tian Sheng sees Rui, a big look of joy, relief, a little bit of guilt creeps in, but mostly joy. She starts to step inside and like give like a big welcoming uh, kind of body language and gesture toward Rui. And then her eyes slide to the side and rest on this guy. And it's like the difference between night and day, between winter and summer. Everything about that joy, everything about that excitement just hardens into a look that you know very well. You know this look very well. You've worn it a lot intense, immense dislike. You don't know if Tian Sheng is physically capable of hating anything or anyone, but this is the closest thing to it. She stops, freezes in her tracks, looks at this guy, Prince, you! And she reaches for her staff. Immediately, without hesitation, I cannot tell you how fast Litany makes this decision. As soon as she reaches for the staff, Litany also squares their shoulders and brings their hands up above their face, prepared to punch this guy out. Because if Tian Sheng, of all people, dislikes this guy, it's 
immediately on site for Litany. <laughs> there is no hope for him. Yeah, you you square your fists, you look at this guy, you're ready to fight him, to kill him if necessary. Tian Sheng reaches for that staff strapped to her back, which you by this point have learned its name is Volition. Reaches for Volition, starts to draw it. Uh, the guy turns, looks surprised, shocked, and then you see shame wash over his face. Guilt, he doesn't resist. He doesn't reach for the knife strapped to his waist. He doesn't reach for the crossbow. Doesn't do anything to defend himself. There's a moment where you think he's just gonna let Tian Sheng cut him down. And then Rui raises a hand, very calmly turns those warm brown eyes on the two of you, takes you in, but addresses Tian Sheng. Tian Sheng, it's okay. We can trust him. And Tian Sheng freezes and says, what is that scum fucking bastard doing in our camp, Rui? He's helping us. Helping us? Helping us? Have you gone? What are you? He burned Mudan Village. He, I, he. And she starts to draw the staff like it's coming out. Uh, and then Rui does something that you've not seen any mortal do or any god even do up until this point. Her eyes begin to glow. A, the brown vaporizes into a bright, scintillating orange, like daybreak, like the rosy fingers of dawn peeking over the horizon. They flash this bright orange, the same timber as the orange of that protection spell, as the orange of that god in that shrine, Xiao Cheng. And it clicks into place what's happening here. You've never seen it in action because you've never been in the cradle until this point. The mandate of heaven. The sign of the gods' favor on a chosen mortal champion. All five rulers of the five great earthly kingdoms have the mandate of heaven. It helps them stay in power. She, this is not a kingdom. She's not King Wu. She's a young woman and yet here she is radiant with borrowed and yet legitimate divine power. Tian Sheng, you have to believe me. I can explain everything. Just put the staff down and please tell your very strong looking friend to also lower their fists. <sighs> Fine. I'm keeping my eye on that scoundrel. She lowers her hand but still stares suspiciously at this prince character. Litany doesn't lower their arms yet until <laughs> Tian Sheng tells them to. Yeah, okay. Then Tian Sheng turns to you as she lowers her uh, arms and just gives you like a nod, though she still looks careful. <sighs> All right. Rui, what's going on? Thank you. Well, I suppose... Before I just fill you in on everything, Tian Sheng, why don't you introduce our guest? I don't want anyone to feel unwelcome here or left out. I would like to feel something or someone out. Okay, excellent idea. So we've done this a few times, so just tell me what you want clarity about and answer either what feels welcoming on the surface or what feels dark or unnerving when you peer deeper. I'm gonna need an explanation for the dynamic <laughs> that's playing out. Okay, for like what the hell right is now. happening here? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so why don't you answer what feels welcoming on the surface or what feels dark or unnerving uh, when you peer deeper? What feels dark or unnerving when Litany peers deeper is the fact that there is very clearly conflict. And Tiangshan just said you burned down Mudan Village to the ground. We're in <laughs> new Mudan Village, but mm -hmm. this seems to be everything that has led up to this moment. There, mm -hmm. is, there is some dark heart of this and it's starting to unfold and unravel. Mm -hmm. There's clearly tension between these three people and Litany has kind of been thrust into the middle of it. Mm, that's absolutely right. You're just like a, a stranger, uh, every sense of the word, uh, caught in the middle of what seems to be, and this is what feels welcoming, familiar on the surface, uh, an intense political situation. Uh, the underworld is rife with schemers, with plotters, with ladder climbers, with bureaucrats. Everyone's scheming and, and jostling elbows, trying to get the queen's favor, trying to ascend the ranks of the infernal administration to serve underneath her. And you've heard vague snatches of rumors that that's what the city of heaven is like as well, a divine bureaucracy, right? As above, so below. 
So this feels familiar. It appears the mortals too have intricate, complex, involved political machinations at play. There's a moment where Litany sees these three mortals and immediately thinks of Bai Guzing, Tang Tang, and Shalong, and they're like, oh no. <laughs> Oh, no. There's something at play here. Yes, absolutely. There's kind of like, you see their faces superimposed. You hear the whispering of the mists. Uh, you see a flash of crimson light and then you're back in the present. And Rui turns to Tiansheng for her to introduce you. <sighs> All right, yes, uh, obviously she like gestures at this prince guy. We know each other. This, this is Litany. And Rui says, oh, that's an interesting name. Litany, daughter of Queen Tsigu, the first fallen Lord of Death, Sovereign on Low of the Underworld, the Silver Tsilian. Oh, oh. And those orange eyes start to fade back to amber and then down to that warm brown. And she looks you up and down like, with new eyes, a new perspective given your introduction. You're a demon? No. I'm then, a... And they glance sideways at Tiansheng. And Tiansheng says, Cultivator. Yeah, 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 they're a cultivator. Uh, Queen Tigu, who I met when I was in the underworld. And at this, the prince person who has not spoken a single word this entire time. Uh, the guilt, the shame is still there, but then like confusion and a deep curiosity clicks in and he says, I'm sorry, the underworld? Yeah, you little bitch. The underworld, which I'm gonna kick your ass down to if you- uh, Tianchong, please. I'm sorry about that, Prince. Uh, please, Rui, I've said just call me Zida. <sighs> Very well, Zida. So, a cultivator from the underworld, a child of the queen of the underworld, then you are a prin? It's complicated. Should we address you as Prin Litany? No. Just Litany then. A good name for a weapon. And that was basically the same thing that Tianzhong said. And Tianzhong says, uh, yeah, I, I ran into Litany on my way out of the underworld and there's a knowing look that transpires between Rui and Tianzhong. But this prince guy, Zidu, as far as you can tell, looks just as confused as he's ever been. And Rui is noting you looking between all of them, taking in the dynamic. And she lets out a kind of knowing smile. And she walks around uh, the war table, essentially, this map, uh, and looks at you uh, and says, I think now is the time for me to perhaps give you, Litany, full context about everything that's happening here. Because there's nothing I believe in more than the ability for mortals to make informed decisions. I know you are just a wayfarer, a wanderer, a companion of Tiansheng's over here. But if you so choose, I'd like to give you the opportunity to make a decision about how you'd like to interact with me, with the prince, sorry, with Tiansheng and with the villagers of New Mudan village and our mission at hand. Your mission? Yes, I our mission. I thought we were just here for the Ascension Gate and Litany looks sideways at Tiansheng. The Ascension Gate? And Tiansheng, who has still been standing at the threshold this entire time, starts sweating. Uh, you can hear the sweat start to like eke out of her pores and drip down the side of her neck. Uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> Rui, the ascension gate that's just, you know, really close to where we are. And Rui gives Tiansheng a smoldering look, turns back to you and with a genuinely kind and a little bit of a, uh, a smile that seems apologetic, uh, she says, the Ascension Gate is not here. It's in Chuancheng, the capital of Twin. That's actually where we're headed. And that seems to be news for Tiansheng. Uh, she snaps out of that like kind of hit dog look and uh, straightens. Chuancheng, that's where all the villages are headed. That's why we're, but why? 
Rui, what's been going on? And Rui starts walking around uh, the war table. She makes her way all the way to the threshold and stands next to you. Uh, not as a gesture of intimidation, not as a gesture of, I know more than you, I'm gonna scrutinize you, but in a attempt to connect with you. And you feel this attempt the same way you have felt every attempt from Tian Sheng these past five days. And as she starts to speak, as she starts to explain everything that's going on here, how do you begin to take all of it in? What is your response to her attempt at connecting with you? It's clumsy. It's the only clumsy way that Whitney has ever held their hands open. Mm. Because they've never held their hands open except to catch rain. They've only ever clenched them into fists. So mm. this connection, this reaching out, this handshake with spit in between is confused, mm. but not unwilling. Mm. It's just new. It's just tentative mm. in a way that they are often not. But they listen. There's something here, that same rattling, that same harmonizing like with like. There's a drive here, a purpose. Mm. And they want to know what it is. And so you listen with curiosity. And Rui speaks. Allow me to tell you the story of New Mudan Village from the very beginning, and my story as well. I received the mandate of heaven when I was 15. I was confronting a corrupt village elder about supplying our entire year's worth of grain for King Wu's army on his latest martial project, and they weren't listening to me. And then I felt it. A power, a strangeness, a, a color, Orange. Mm. That's right. Orange. I felt this divine power come through me and the mandate of heaven. This bright color shone through my eyes. And ever since then, I've been leading my people. I led my people for six years. Six proud years. I took us away from the stolid traditions that King Wu insisted upon, only tithes of gems, only gifts of blessings for armors and weapons and magical implements for killing and death and struggle. That's not what our people needed. That's not what our people need. We needed good food. We needed clean water. We needed stable shelter. We needed education. We needed safe childbirth. All of these things. So I stopped tithing to Tianli. I started tithing to other gods, even though this was against what King Wu had ordered, even though this was against tradition. We disobeyed. I disobeyed for the betterment of our people. And we prospered. Trade routes bloomed. We grew from a humble, lowly, impoverished hamlet to a bustling mountain town, Mudan village. And then, King Wu heard. How could he not? Some young upstart woman with the mandate of heaven building a new way of life, a different way of life. A way of life that shirked tradition. A way of life that abandoned military principles. Because yes, I abandoned those principles. I ensured that we took a pacifist stance. That we did not train ourselves to be Warriors, but rather farmers, community members, educators, artists. And he didn't like that. I was a threat to his power. So he sent his son, Prince Wu. And the prince closes his eyes and his hand rests over the top of that helm and starts in a anxious habit, stroking uh, the red fur that comes from the top of it. He clenches a fistful of it, and then when he opens his eyes, though his fingers are shaking along the fur, his voice is steady. My father heard. He heard of the woman with the mandate, the threat to his power. He sent me 
and 500 men to Mudan village to burn it to the ground. And Tianxiong crosses her arms, leans against the threshold and says, huh, how'd that work out for you, champ? And without looking at Tianxiong, Prince Wu says, you were there, you fought off my men, we could not take the village. Tianxiong leans into you and says, all by myself. Yeah. Then how did it burn? And at that, Tianxiong freezes in like mid gloat, steals her jaw, something pops in it. And you see a similar look as the one when she was talking about the Ascension Gate this whole time at you, but so much more intense, so much more jagged and cutting guilt. Yes, intense guilt, but also the same exact expression that's colored over Prince Wu's face this entire time. Shame. It doesn't look good on Tianxiang, this shame. It makes her look smaller, more doubtful, more vulnerable. And a spitting word from your mother's mouth, a memory of it, cuts through your head. In this moment, seeing this expression on Tianzhong's face, do you think of her as weak? No. And they don't know why. And they don't know how. But for the first time, they push that word away. It's not right. She just wouldn't understand. Hmm. And Tianzhong, with that shame still so hot and dark on her face, like black fire leans away from the threshold, kind of curls her hands into fists at her sides, squares her hips against uh, the prince, and then looks down and says, well, that lion bastard, he tricked me. No, I was foolish enough to be tricked. And Prince Wu says, when he heard of the defeat of 500 men, when I reported it to my father. He said he would send me double the amount, a thousand, to storm the village, beat this cultivator, and burn it to the ground. Seize her, kill her. Bring him her head, with the eyes plucked out, as a sign of the crushed mandate. But I knew it wouldn't work. <laughs> this cultivator, I know we have our differences. Yeah, that's one way of putting it, our differences. But she is strong. She's powerful. You've been traveling with her, apparently. You know how strong she is. I knew I couldn't beat her, no matter the size of the army. Every man she took on, she just got stronger and stronger, the, the thrill of the fight or something like that. You know, honestly, I don't know what was more humiliating. The fact that 500 of my men were defeated single-handedly by just one cultivator, or the fact that she spared every single one of their lives. <laughs> But I knew that a thousand men wouldn't be able to take Mudan village. I knew throwing just men at this problem wasn't going to... wasn't going to accomplish what my father had asked of me. So I stepped outside of the regular twin playbook. Tia, our neighboring kingdom, had been formulating a new kind of technological innovation. Gunpowder. And Tiansheng at that turns to you and says, he said he was gonna do me. He lied. He said he was gonna have a one-on-one -on -one fight with me away from the village and that if I beat him fair and square, no tricks, then they'd leave Mudan village alone. Not just that, but that they'd recognize Mudan village's sovereignty. I mean, I, I couldn't turn that down. Of course I had to show up. I had no reason to doubt him. I. It, it was too fucking good to be true. But it was me, I, I, I went, I didn't even tell Rui, he, uh, those were the conditions and I... And as I waited there, there was an, a noise like thunder coming out of the cliff and, and the cliff exploded. I don't know how else to explain it. It exploded, it, 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 it detonated. And before I knew it, I was pinned under a, a fucking mountain of rubble, a landslide of just mud and dirt and rock. At least 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 pounds of it. Tons and tons of it. I, I tried digging myself out of it, but, but I couldn't. Not in time. 
And, and I could hear it. The screaming. The fire. Mudan village burning to the ground. That bastard sent in his 500 men and he burned Mudan village to the ground and it was all my fault. And Rui puts a hand on Tianzheng's shoulder and for a second you think Tianzheng might flinch and throw it off like a wounded wolf. But she doesn't. She resists the impulse. You see the impulse. You know the impulse. And she quashes it down and leans into Rui's touch. And the look on Rui's face is so similar, almost exactly the same as the look on Sui Xin's face. Toward you. Not pity, no, empathy, sorrow. And Rui says, it wasn't your fault, Tianxiong. You were just trying your best. If anything, it was my fault. And I know, I know, don't cut in to say the blame is not mine. As a leader, I must accept responsibility for what happened to my village. I refused to build up a military for Mudan village. I refused to build a standing army. I refused to even train our people for the art of war. I wanted to resist this tradition so much, I, I completely turned it away. And as a result, without Tiansheng, we were helpless. We could do nothing. We were farmers. <laughs> we had no arms, we had no training. The soldiers came in and they burned everything. Everything, everything we built for the past six years. The trade routes destroyed, our farms destroyed, our homes gone in a single night. And with every word, Prince Wu looks more and more ashamed. But Rui looks at him not with blame even, but understanding and a new kind of reckoning as she pivots her gaze away from you and toward Prince Wu. But I heard you, you know, Tido. I heard you give the order. Spare them. Burn the homes, but spare the villagers. And we fled, of course. We fled into the mountains. I found Tiansheng, us, all of us working together. We dug her out of the rubble, and for the past two years, we've been hiding out here. And we have a name for ourselves. The Winds of Change. Because King Wu tried to burn us all. Wanted my head, wanted my eyes. He didn't get that. He tried to quash it. What he really did was light the spark of rebellion. I believe that every mortal life should be worth living. That every mortal soul should have the opportunity to make meaningful choices. That's why I led my people away from just obeying what's always been done. That is the one thing I do not regret, no matter what happened. But now I know I have to couple that with our ability to defend ourselves. Which is why we've taken up arms. We've taken up training. I've tithed to martial gods. Not Tianli. <laughs> that would be a conflict of interest, you understand. But other gods who understand our cause, who grant us arms, who grant us knowledge of how to defend ourselves. Choice and power, that's what we need. That's what all of us need to decide our own futures. Will you join us? Me. You. I've seen the way Tianzheng has been looking at you this whole time. You must be strong. What? What? Huh? No, I'm not. I'm not looking at them any particular way. Tianzheng, come on. You're looking at them the way that you look at someone that you... respect. Martially. Of course. So will you join us? The story is more compelling than Litany wants to believe. It's more honest than they've ever felt. In a way, it's troubling. <laughs> they understand so clearly purpose. 
It's everything to them. It's their fists, it's their knees, it's their bones, it's their lungs that don't breathe air, it's their heart that doesn't beat. It's their purpose, right? Their purpose to kill Longdu, the immortal emperor. But these people, this mortal, all of these mortals, all three of them, they have a purpose too. And the way that Rui's hand rested on Tiangshan's shoulder, it It was a purpose that loved them back. It was a purpose that would let them say mother. <laughs> and something inside litany box breaks a little? No, no. They want to say yes. But they can't. Why not? They have a mission. They have a purpose. It's about redemption. I told you already. It's about redemption. It's about killing the god they were meant to kill. It's about your mortal heart. It's not about that. It's about choice. I can't. I need to go to an ascension gate. Understood. But, huh, fate smiles upon us all. That's where we're headed. Like I said, we're going to Chuancheng and the Ascension Gate is in the capital. And Tiansheng, as you deliberate, says, why are we going to Chuancheng? And Rui's smile grows. <laughs> you see, Tiansheng, when you set out three weeks ago on your quest and you stole the river seal from King Wu, and Tiansheng goes, oh, I don't, we don't have to, uh. Right, okay. Yep, that's where I got the river seal. I, three weeks ago, as Rui so explicitly said in great detail, I snuck into the capital, you know, my transformations, you know, disguise as an attendant, right? Oh, what have you. A very cute attendant, by the way. Uh, very gender. Uh, went into the throne room, stole the river seal from its seat of honor, because I, because I, I, because what happened at Mudan was my fault. And for the past two years, I've seen the villagers suffer and train and, and it was your purpose. It was my purpose. Exactly. So I knew, I knew what had to be done. This is all about the gods. <laughs> this has always, always been about the gods. Rui, even your power, your ability to lead, your ability to build Mudan up to what it was, was because of the mandate of heaven. Because Xiao Ch uh, the unnamed god that chose you, chose you. So I thought, I was able to go up to the city of heaven, talk to your God face to face. Maybe I could convince them to directly help us. Maybe I could convince your God to reveal themselves instead of having to hide. There's something about Rui's God, their identity needing to be kept a secret. Something about how it's against the rules for them in particular to choose a champion. Well, yes, it's because they're the emperor's virtue. <laughs> and Prince Wu says, what? That's the god who gave you your mandate? The virtue of heaven? Themself? And Rui says, oh, Zita, don't get... Yes, yes. And with the kind of like, yeah, I guess I am a boss bitch, kind of like, but like trying to be humble about it. Like, yes, yes, but, but, but they made me promise not to tell anybody because they'd get in trouble with the emperor themselves. They said they just couldn't watch and wait idly by anymore. They had to use their power <laughs> What? That's the what... virtue may not disobey the emperor. I know. They're going behind the emperor's back to help us. Which is why I have to do right by them. I have to do right by my people. I have to do right by this mandate, by this power of the orange I've been given. While I still have it. While it's still here. Before my chance in the limelight is gone. Because we mortals. We only live for so long, we have to make our lives count, right? <sighs> right. I wanted to talk to Xiao Cheng, convince them to stop being such a coward and just be open about it and support us directly. So I went to the Ascension Gate, which is right outside Chuancheng, right outside it. It's like just three or four kilometers away. And 
I ascended. I went to the city of heaven. It was, ooh, I mean, the gods there, they are, they are lookers, let me tell you that. But but I, as soon as I tried to find the virtue, I tried to go to this, uh, what's it called? The Hall of, of Grand Fatal. Peerless Destiny. Yeah. yeah, 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 the Hall of Peerless Destiny. How'd you? Anyway, I try to go to the Hall of Peerless Destiny, but I guess they found out pretty quickly that I wasn't supposed to be there. I mean, I didn't look like King Wu, and they, you know, the head administrator kept a strict tally of where all the river seals are supposed to belong, and I wasn't on the list. They called me a thief. I tried to break and enter my way into the Hall of Peerless Destiny and, and find Xiao Cheng, but then before I could even get inside this huge god, this gentlewoman scholar person with this big flaming sword, she bat me all the way back down to the mortal realm, and I think I would have died, probably. Yeah, I probably would have died from the fall, but then I think it was because I was holding the river seal that I fell through the cradle and, well, you know the rest, into the underworld. Yeah, uh-huh, mm-hmm. Litany gives Tiangshan a long, rather withering look. <laughs> she, she shrivels under it like a little raisin in the sun. Mm. And then they pivot to Rui. Fine. I'll travel with your winds of change until I reach the Ascension. Lovely. We would be honored to have you because the time to strike is now. After the river seal was discovered missing, King Wu sent out the vast majority of the standing army remaining in Chuancheng to look for it which means the capital is, and Tiansheng cuts in with understanding, undefended. A skeleton crew at most. Now's the perfect time. But the way to get in, and she looks reluctantly at Prince Wu. I have maps of the palaces. I have maps of the secret tunnels that will lead us right to the throne room. Even your rebel camp of huh, 500 some, 600 some, would be able to take the capital easy, right now. But, like Ruby said, the time to strike is now. And Tian Chong says, Okay, hold on. One last question. Why the hell is he here? Like, the, how did he, why is he, what? And Prince Wu says, I defected. I, huh, I defected. You know, that's actually the first time I've said that out loud. I disobeyed my father and I defected and I'm, I'm, and he kind of leans against the table. A traitor now, a traitor to my kingdom, but two years ago when I failed to bring the head of this, of you, Rui, to my father, he demoted me from commanding general of his army. And I have had a lot of time to think in these past two years. I've always been torn between, well, making my father proud being the son he wants me to be, being the ruler he needs me to be, and the people, I suppose. It just, it's just not right to kill defenseless villagers, that's all. And Rui turns that face, <laughs> that expression of sorrow and empathy that she had held for Tiansheng onto Prince Wu. And she turns it inward. You've never seen anything like it before. Someone holding this sorrow for themselves, but in a way that isn't jagged, in a way that doesn't cut, in a way that even Sui Xin didn't, in a way that feels kind. Weak, snarls your mother's voice in your head. Kind, weak, kind. And Rui says to Tiansheng to Prince Wu, perhaps also to you. We're all failures. And it's not a judgment. It's not an indictment. It's not a snarl. It's just a statement of fact. And she follows it up with, but that's not always a bad thing. Because yes, I failed my people when I chose the route of pacifism, when I completely shirked some of the lessons of tradition. And yes, I also failed when I used the mandate of heaven to stand against King Wu, because in his eyes, that made me a failure of his kingdom. That made me a failure of a villager. And in his eyes, 
You, Prince Wu, are also a failure. By choosing not to commit slaughter, by choosing your people, you failed. You failed him. And Tian Sheng, my dear Tian Sheng, my protector, my knight, my stalwart hero, you blame yourself. I know you do. You think you have failed as well when you were tricked by Prince Wu. But truly, it was us who failed you for relying on you solely to protect us, to protect our village. And perhaps there is a failure for you as well to think that you are the only one able to shoulder that burden. Let us help ourselves. That's the best way you can help us. Yes, we need your strength, Tian Sheng. Don't turn your face from me now. We need your strength. But we must also shepherd our own. As for you, Litany, <laughs> name of a weapon, name of a person. I know not your story. I know you are the daughter of Queen Tigu, a very fearsome and impressive and burden-filled name. I know not of your story. I know not of your failures. But I hope that these breaks do not define us but help guide us toward a path we get to tread ourselves. Never before has a mortal spoken to Litany like this. They've never heard anyone speak like this. And there is a moment where <laughs> it's no wonder that she has the mandate of heaven. But that awe is crushed by the weight of the words that she wields. And it's there, the shame, the guilt, the failure, it's all there. And I think for the first time, Litany is in a fight they can't win. They don't know how to quash this. The tenants how could the tenants help them here? There are no gods to kill. Their purpose is... faltering. And that strike of fear dips into the center of Litany, cracks them open again, and I think they just look at Rui, look at Tian Sheng, look at even the prince whose face looks just like theirs, <laughs> and they nod once. May the winds be in your favor, then. And they stumble backward out of the room. They turn, mm. they go. Mm. I think on seeing you stumble, right, there's a moment where something in Rui's gaze flickers. She says, and may hope sing from every peak. We leave at dawn, is everything? And you hear Tian Sheng go, oh, yeah, I, uh, Litany? And you hear footsteps following you out. For a moment when they're alone on this little porch out front, they don't go very far. They don't run anywhere. Where are they going to go? They don't know anything about Yaolan. They need to stay here. They need to focus. They need to be a better god killer than this. Right? Right. There's a moment where they... They just take a beat. And they hear it their mortal heart. The dum. The dum. The dum. The dum. They are a failure. And for so long they've lived under the weight of that. But this place is weightless. How can that be? Really? Could they also? No, and I think that's when Tian Sheng catches up to them. 
Hey. Hey. I think I know why you're upset. <sighs> they just kind of huff and turn their face away from her. I'm... I'm sorry. I'm sorry I lied about the Ascension Gate. <sighs> wow. wow, I just... I needed to get back here. And you understand why now, right? Because it's like Rui said, I, f I failed these people. And, and in that moment, something clicks for you that that is what Rui said. It's what you're mulling over, but you understand her intentions as not calling Tianzheng a failure, but saying that it's more complicated than that. But it seems to have only registered in its surface reading for Tianzheng. And as Tianzheng continues, you see a reflection of your own struggle here happening on her face as those words, just like they're sticking with you, stick with her. Failure, I just, I know, I, I, I failed. I failed. I failed Mudan Village. I mean, our leader said so herself. So I had to get back here. I had to tell her everything that was happening. I had to, to report about my other failure up in the city of heaven, getting knocked all the way down to the underworld. I'm glad they were able to do something, I guess, with my plan, stealing the river seal. I'm glad that ended up working in our You favor. don't understand. Mortals are allowed to fail. <laughs> you say that like you're not a mortal. I'm not. Okay, but you're not not immortal either. Yeah, that's what your fucked up soul has been telling me. What? I've been watching it change these past five days. Hell, it's changing right now. It's kind of freaky. It's freaking me out. What are you talking about? Remember how I said your soul was so heavy and... Okay, most mortal souls move. They're like flame. It's kind of like tea, you know, it, it wavers like a vapor. It has, has they're a color. Your soul is just black. It's, it's a black hole and it looks so heavy. And even looking at it, I feel like I'm gonna drown in it. And I can't imagine what it feels like to carry it around. But this entire time I've been seeing cracks in it. I don't know. They're bright though. Like these bright little, I don't know, cracks. They've been getting wider, moving even. Right now. So yeah, your soul does read kind of mortal, but also not. But it's definitely not a god soul, but also it kind of is. It's it's something in between, and it's both, and it's neither. That's, that's the best way I can explain it. But that means you're allowed to fail too. No, I'm not. I've already, already come so far. I can't fail again. And I'd like to connect with someone. <gasps> I think this is the first time you're using this move. <laughs> We've, it's, it's a big milestone. Okay, so when you try to connect with someone, tell them something intimate and answer one. I will reveal a fragment of their pain as they answer the other. What common ground do we share? And what still divides us? When Litany says, I can't fail, for the first time, this is a different kind of determination. It's not even determination. It's not that drive. It's not that hunger. It's not that lion racing through a field of obsidian grass. It is so small and so lonely and so agonizingly empty because their success is all they have. Without it, they are literally nothing. And that scares them. That scares them more than a cultivator ever could. That scares them more than an army ever could. That scares them more than a god or a demon ever could. They've been nothing for a hundred years. They don't want to be nothing anymore. They can't fail here. Why doesn't she understand? 
And I think that's the common ground you share. If that's okay with you. Mm. Because you're both struggling in this moment, asking yourselves, why can't they just understand? That's what you don't understand what she isn't getting. And she looks at you and the words tumble out of her mouth. No, no, that's not... Look, I know you're doing this for your mom, your maker, and you have to do this thing, and I, I get it. I know what it feels like to have to do this thing, but what I just don't get about you is why you can't see other pathways to that. Can't there be other ways to, to you know, do right by your mom, maker, mom? Do you have to just kill the emperor? Can't you make her happy some other way? Like, by living your best life, right? That's what Rugi wants for me. That's what the monkeys wanted for me. I mean, they couldn't talk, but I understood what they wanted. They just wanted me to be happy. And that's all your mom wants. All your mom wants is, is for you to be happy. So whether that's killing the emperor or deciding to, to help us, maybe you can do both. Or, okay, not both. Because killing the emperor is, <clears throat> and I probably shouldn't be shouting about killing the emperor, <clears throat> your mission, your secret mission, because your secret mission is the fallout can be disastrous and let's just put that aside for now. What about another way to make her happy? There is no other way. It's not about making her happy. It's about serving the purpose I was made for. Uh, didn't she make you because she wanted a kid? You know, to like raise a kid and... No. Love? What do you mean? She made me to kill the immortal emperor Longdu. I That's mean... my purpose. You've said that before, but you mean li literally? That's... Oh. Oh. And Litany, that is very much what still divides the two of you. Because yeah, even though Tian Sheng insists that you are at least partway, halfway, in the liminal space of being mortal, you were made to be a weapon. And mortals, mortals aren't made to be anything at all. They just are and they get to choose. And I will now answer, what common ground do we share? You know, for what it's worth, your soul kind of looks like mine in some ways. I can see my own soul too, when I look down at my chest. It's hard sometimes, you know, because the muscles get in the way, yeah. But, um, it's not cracked exactly. <sighs> you know what? I guess it kind of is. My soul is gold, and there are these veins that run through it, I guess, that look like cracks. They weren't always there. I got a new crack every time I started cultivating. Every time I grew in power, when I found volition, I got a crack. When I left the monkeys, I got a crack. When I learned to put on clothes, I got a crack. When I failed Wudan Village, there were a lot of cracks. Then why do you keep doing it? because it's what I want to do. Litany sits with that for a long time, similar to the way that they've been traveling. There's a lot of silence in Litany. There's a lot of empty space that needs time to fill it. There's nothing else that can. But eventually they nod, and look sideways. Thank you. I think that's a milestone. I think that's the first time you've and said- And I'm not going to kick your ass 
for lying to me. Right, that. <clears throat> I appreciate that because it still kind of smarts from where you punched me in the solar plexus way back in the underworld. <laughs> That's gonna bruise. Four days. Not four days, like four days. You get it. Thank you for not killing me. But you will still take me to the Ascension Gate. Yes, absolutely. And that is a promise I will uphold. I'll take you there. A deal's a deal. I, I do uphold my word. It just might not always be... <laughs> and on that litany, dusk falls, you spend the night in Mudan Village. Rui insists on finding you a place indoors to sleep. You bed down in the same room, the same area as Tiansheng. Interestingly, you overhear some of the other villagers who seem very curious about you. You're gonna hear them in the hallway, peeking through the window and they kind of duck down when you look. Uh, you overhear snatches of conversation that suggests Tiansheng has her own place that isn't in this guest quarters, but she insists on keeping an eye on you uh, and keeping you company is what she says to the villagers. Like, oh, you know, this is a new friend, a new friend. I, I gotta keep him company, you know. I, I wanna give him the old Mudan welcome. And just as Rui had suggested, when dawn breaks, this group of rebels, some 500, 600 strong at most, set out. They set out on the path that Prince Wu had drawn in uh, accordance with Rui's knowledge of the mountain to a secret way of going through the chain so they can attack the capital, uh, lay siege to it, sneak through it, claim the throne without using any of the major trade routes or major pathways where King Wu's army is definitely gonna be moving all around and keeping eyes and sentries out for. And you travel with this group of rebels through this jagged mountain pass for several days. As you travel, you take in the nature and the world around you. It's beautiful. The colors, the breeze, It's the always sky. been beautiful. It's always been beautiful. And I think there's something healing about how beautiful it is. I'd like you to clear one strain. <sighs> As you spend several days traveling through the amethyst chain. And as you travel, you notice that Tian Sheng basically refuses to leave your side, even though you have to stick to her because you want to keep an eye on the river seal, right? Uh, she kind of turns down invitations to hang out for too long. She kind of comes back to you, brings you munitions, shares a steamed bun with you. I think it's the first time you've ever had a mortal steamed bun. And everything seems to be going to plan. There are no ambushes, no sudden disasters, no summer rains that slow your trek. Everything seems to be going really well. The winds of fortune are at your backs. And when you are about two or three days out from the capital and you're starting to exit the mountain chain, on the fourth day of travel, while you are walking, all of you hear shouts coming from the front of the procession, all shouting the same thing. Army, army, and then disperse. And all the rebels shout this order, this warning up the chain, army, army, disperse, disperse. And they start dispersing into the woods around you. And then you hear it, this army coming up the path from Chuancheng the other way. You see them from up on this peak, a sea of red, a sea of red and gold. You are outnumbered one to three at least. 1,500, 1,700 soldiers one of those marching armies that King Wu had sent. <laughs> a twist of fate, a spike of dew. And Tian Sheng, heart rate spiking, you can hear it thrumming in your chest like a war drum. She jumps to attention, unsheaths volition, and shouts as everyone disperses and the army starts coming up and they start drawing their swords and shouting, rebels, traitors, and running up the path. She says, go, I'll hold them off. And she spins volition. She's talking to you. Without a word, Litany raises their fist, cracks one, cracks two, and stands next to her. You square yourself. She smiles. <laughs> you sure? You should go. It's gonna be pretty hard. There's like 1,500 of them. 
You're not sailing today. And neither are you. Come on, let's see what you got when you're not throwing those punches at me. <laughs> and you charge into the fray. Thank you so much for tuning in to God Killer Last Hope. If you've been enjoying this series, please consider joining Transplainer's Patreon at patreon.com slash transplanerrpg. It's the best way to support us for as little as $3 a month, so we can continue bringing great performances like this one. If you can't spare the funds, please consider leaving a positive review or comment posting about us on social media, or sharing the show with a friend that you think will enjoy us. Thanks to the support of our audience, we are continually able to do this awesome work. And you can purchase the ash can of Godkiller RPG on itch.io backslash by Connie Chong. The games for release will be published through Evil Hat Productions in 2025. And as always, our sponsors for this series are Frivolous Bear Studios and Hero Forge. Thank you for helping us create these powerful stories. And with that, our game comes to a close for now. We'll see you next time, right here on Transplanter RPG.